now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Orson Welles starring in the prequel to the motion picture The Third Man in the lives of Harry Lyme because Harry Lyme was killed in the motion picture. This came out afterwards as one of the earliest prequels. This from March 28, 1952. This episode entitled Pleasure Before Business. Presenting Orson Welles as the third man. The Lives of Harry Lyme. The fabulous stories of the immortal character originally created in the motion picture The Third Man. With Zilla Music by Anton Carroll. You know... There are two kinds of men who should be wary and suspicious of women. The serious businessman, because women can be so frivolous, and the frivolous seeker after pleasure, because women can be so serious. Now I, Harry Lyme, am both a serious businessman of sorts and a seeker after pleasure, so perhaps I should avoid women entirely. But the trouble is, I just can't seem to do without them, for either. Sometimes life gets very complicated with business and pleasure. But interesting. Always interesting. It was in Venice, not long after the war was over, that I found myself with a problem on my hands. It wasn't the old Venetian one about finding a place to park my car. I had a very solid and sound business transaction all lined up, but I was sorely in need of what I called a partner, and what the police of several countries would have been pleased to refer to as an accomplice. Accordingly, I was highly pleased while strolling about among the pigeons and people in St. Mark's Square one day when I spied Joan Willoughby, who was standing there scattering bounty to the birds. Why, Joan! Joan Willoughby! How are you? Harry Lyme, what are you doing in Venice? That's a question I was going to ask you. Oh, me? Holiday. And you? Business. I'm glad to hear it. Ought to be able to make a bob or two tipping off the coppers. Always were a heavy tipper, weren't you, my love? I need a partner. Do you now? Mm. Girl? Girl. Dangerous? No, not very. Fun? Lots. Money in it? Quite a bit. Well, holidays can be quite boring, don't you think? What's the game this time, and do I need much of a wardrobe? I'll tell you privately. Let's get out in the canal. Huh? Uh, do you mind if we use a boat? All right. We rented a gondola and floated slowly down the Grand Canal. It was a handy bit of luck meeting Joan. She was an English girl, and as delicately simple and unassuming as roast beef and Yorkshire pudding, as beautiful as the English bone china, but with as much bite as English mustard on the side. She had the realism and the sound business sense of a robber baron. In the gondola, she trailed her hand in the water and waited for me to tell her what was up. Well? Joan, have you ever heard of somebody called a Count de la Robbia? No. Well, he's the usual Italian count, except that he's saved one or two things. Still has his palace, still has some valuable pictures, still has jewels. And we're after the jewels. We're after the jewels. He's a friend of mine. I've known him for at least three weeks. He's still friends with you, Harry? Mm Mm-hmm. He likes me. He trusts me. But? Exactly. But I can't find out where he keeps the jewels. Or I might be able to in time if it weren't for this... Rico. At which point I say who or what is Rico? Who he is doesn't matter. What he is matters greatly. He is, or seems to be, seven feet tall. Mm, a big mm. stumbling block, Harry. Perfect description. He's the Count's bodyguard. He's killed several men who've tried to cheat the Count. He does not like me, Rico. And that's why you need me. Exactly. Do I work on the Count you or work, Rico? You work on the Count. That's good. I'll be the second story man on the job and try and distract his seven-foot shadow. All you have to do is find out where the jewels are kept. You'll probably Sarah discover John. that they're kept in Rico's pockets. No, I, I think that's where Rico keeps the count. Oh, you've got a fence? Of course. 
I don't need to make me happy as a fence. Count's little ivy-covered palace. And you, my dear Joe. What sort of split are you offering? Shall we say uh, 60-40? We shall say 50-50. Well... 50-50, Harry. All right. Fine. When do I meet the Count? Tonight. I can't wait. I don't think you'll have to, my dear. So that was that. When I had the jewels in my hand, it would be time enough to inform Joan that the split would be 70-30. <clears throat> she was a sensible girl, and business, after all, is business. That night, I brought Joan to the cafe that I knew the Count frequented. He was there all right, and so was Rico. We went directly to their table. Ah, oh, Mr. Lime, how are you? Very well, very well, thank you, Count. I'd like to present Miss Joan Willoughby, the uh, Count de la Robia. How do you do? Charmed, Miss Willoughby. And uh, Rico. Hello. Rico? Uh, Rico what? It's just Rico, it's enough. Yeah, uh, I'll say it's enough. You must sit down here, Miss Willoughby. You must share our table. Oh, why, thank you. That's very good of you, Count. Count de la Robia. Uh, yes, Rico? Does this man have to be here? Of course he stays, Rico. <laughs> Miss Willoughby, you are visiting our city. Yes, it's the first time. Oh, I love it. But you know, you Italians all look so sad. Our recent history has not been happy. When I see someone, well, like you, Count, with big black sad eyes like yours, I say to myself, I want to do something to make that man happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure, Miss Willoughby, that you, I'm quite... <laughs> uh -huh, yes, uh, but that's exactly what Joan is here for, Count. She just wants to lift uh, all your cares. Well, I mean it, Harry. Count de la Robbia, there's nothing I'd like better than to get to know this beautiful city. Really know it and, well, some of the people. Well, uh, I think it might be possible to arrange. Perhaps it's not a time for Mr. Lyme to leave, Count. Oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Lyme, but he is my keeper, my confidant, my advisor. I'm sorry, too, old man, but Miss Willoughby has already agreed to ride in the rumble seat of my gondola tonight. The English lady has said she wishes the Count to show Venice to her. But she has an engagement with me, little friend of all the world. Oh, Harry, don't be stuffy. Count, I appeal to you now. I'm unable to control Rico, you know, Mr. Lyme. Yes, I... I'm afraid I wouldn't know which button to push either. Besides, Harry, I never met a Count before. I'm just full of questions about, oh, crests, coats of arms, you know, and all that sort of thing. Oh, just a moment. I, I have a suggestion. Perhaps even though I am showing the city to Miss Willoughby, perhaps Mr. Lyme can stay with us. An excellent idea, Count. It solves all our difficulties. No. Oh. No, Rico? Rico says no. No, Count. If this man is along, it will ruin the pleasure you and Miss Willoughby want to have. He leaves. Oh, he leaves, eh? See. Si. Well, it looks like Rico's got my evening all planned. Well, don't feel too bad, Harry, darling. Come. Well, why argue, Joan? He's bigger than both of us. I'm sorry, Mr. Lyme, but with Rico, I can do nothing. I don't think I could do much either. Hmm. And I'm out of condition. Rico escorted me to the street with a grip on my forearm that wasn't cleared in my insurance policy. I didn't let the elation I felt show in my face until he'd gone back to join the others. Joan was punching away like Joe Lewis, and the count would be wide open for a sucker punch, but pronto. He called me the next evening. Yeah? Uh, Mr. Lyme, uh, this is the Count de la Robia. Oh, yes. Hello, Count. I'm sorry you couldn't be with us last night, but Rico, you know, has his prejudices. Oh, I wouldn't cheat him out of one of them, old man. That uh, is a very charming girl, that Joan of Willoughby. Hmm. I think she is, yes. I'm wondering where I can get in touch with her. You didn't ask her? Uh, no. Confidentially, I tried to find out, but she was somewhat uh, coy about it. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think she uh, likes me? Well, I don't know. Of course, old man, I was only there for the preliminaries. I missed the main bout, but it seemed to me that she did. After all, she was willing to break her date with me. Uh, that is true. Uh, I like her so very much. I, I was afraid to... Um, Press my luck. Is that how you say it? Yes, that's how you say it. Do you want me to press on for you? I, I would be indebted if you would. I'll try, Count. I'll let you know if I find her. Thank you, Mr. Lyme. Goodbye. Goodbye, old man. Was that the Count, Harry? Yeah. We've got him where we want him, Joan. He's looking all over Venice for you. Is he now? Oh, the old dear. I've told him I'll try to find you. I think it might take me at least two or three days, don't you? Well, don't let it take too long. I'm as anxious to get the jewels as you are, honey, but I oh, think you know yes, the circumstances. Oh, yes, yes, the jewels. Dear lady, what do you mean, oh, yes, the jewels, with that tone of mm, voice? Nothing. He really was taken with me, hmm? Of course he was. You let him stay until he's 
ready to be taken in style. Oh, he's such a shy old dear. Dear enough to wait three days for him. The next night at the same cafe, I ran into the Count once more. He was mournfully staring into a glass of Chianti. And you cannot find her, Mr. Lyon? Not yet. Of course, I don't know her too well, Count, but I'm still looking. Look well, you. The Count has spoken. He wants to see that girl. I'm sure Mr. Lyon is doing all he can, Rico. Looking high and low, my dear Rico. Not as high as you, of course, but low. Yeah, indeed, low. Mr. Lyon, this young lady means a great deal to me. You would not suspect it, but I am a lonely man. I have only Rico. Well, personally, I think Rico is plenty. Mind your tongue, Americano. Consider it minded, tiny Tim. She is so charming, and even though I am shy, she seems not to mind. Most girls do not like her uh, when a man suffers from being shy. Well, Joan's a very sympathetic girl. She's suffered herself, you know. Oh, really? Oh, yes, yes. Her family was very wealthy, but during the war when England was fighting for its very existence, she and her father poured their wealth into the war effort. Nothing mattered to them but patriotism. Viva! Viva, yes, you're so right. After the war, nothing was left but Joan's jewels. And though jewels meant everything to us, they do to most women, she sold them without hesitation in order that her old father might eat. Oh, that is very touching. Yes, I have always thought so. Uh, jewels mean a great deal to her, eh? Well, they did once, old man. She has none left now. Uh, jewels might uh, win her heart? Mm, well, they, they, they might. Mr. Yeah. Lyme, when you find her, I hope you will be able to persuade her to come to see me, no matter when it is, no matter what the time. Bring her to me, even in the middle of the night, even to my palace. The middle of the night, your palace. It's a date, old man. I took him in his word, because there was nothing I'd like better than to have Joan in the Count's palace. First, of course, I briefed her on the little English history that I invented about her. I let the Count ferment in his own grape juice. But finally... See? Si. Uh, Mr. Lyme, Rico, I have Joan Willoughby with me. The English girl? Mm, hello, Rico. Joan the Willoughby, open the door, Rico. <laughs> Miss Willoughby, it is such a pleasure. Oh. Oh, hello, Mr. Lyme, come in, come in. Uh, this way, we will go to the drawing room. Hmm. Oh, this is a lovely place. You will like it. We have still a few things of value here, saved from the war, hmm. saved from Mussolini. You see, uh, this picture... Small, but beautiful, is it not? Oh, it is very beautiful. It's in Toretto. Hmm. Huh. That small but beautiful picture must be worth a small but beautiful fortune, you know? Always you are interested in the price of things, my friend. <laughs> scarcely <laughs> worth that. it's a... <laughs> What do you say, Count? Go right ahead. <laughs> it's scarcely worth a fortune. About 2,000 English pounds, oh. I say. But uh, come. Uh, now, come this way. Oh, dear. Oh, why? What is the matter, Miss Willoughby? This place. I know, I know, I know, Joan. It, it reminds her of the home that she lost, Count. Oh, Mr. Lyme has told me about your family, Miss Willoughby. He has told me, too, about your jewels. Oh, yes, my jewels. I shall never see them again. Perhaps tonight I could show you my jewels. Perhaps you would uh, like uh, to see them. Yes, that would probably cheer you up a great deal, wouldn't it, my dear? Uh, if you wish. Count de uh, Yes, Rico? Oh. If you are to show the jewels, this man must leave. Oh. Our seven-foot duenna has spoken again. In a way, Mr. Lyme, Rico is right. The jewels are most valuable. It would be wrong of me to allow everybody to see them or see where I hide them. I see. Or rather, the ideas I shouldn't see. Of course, with Miss Willoughby, it's different. Jewels are for women, and a Joe like myself hasn't the slightest curiosity about them. Canaletto, landscapes, or Hispana Suizas. As a man, I have to be on the lookout for bigger things. You leave now. Yes, Rico, you're one of those bigger things I keep an eye on. <laughs> And so I left, knowing that Joan was going to accomplish her mission this night, and that soon, very soon, the long hand of fate and Rico permitting, we would be all set, as they say in another popular sport, ready to take the count. In a moment, Orson Welles returns as Harry Lyme, the third man. March 28, 1952, The Lives of Harry Lyme on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. 
It's a big, bold story set in the heartland of America, along the edge of Lonely Mountain. I am open for business. And so Big William Gorgon, played by handsome Michael James, fiercely set down his Midwest roots. Oh, darling, we're going to sell bathrobes and raise chickens. Set his adoring wife, Wilhelmina, portrayed by beautiful Glenda Olson. Oh, I love our store, Will. But they hadn't counted on Big Ralph's bathrobes and cattle store coming to town. Oh, Will, Will, what will we do, Will? Will had a plan, a way of facing off against tough Big Ralph. We're going to change the face of America. We're going to advertise. Advertise what? The print and broadcasting and bus benches. We're going to tell people who we are and where we are. What's a bus? And so the story of how one man brought advertising to the heartland. Oh, Will, will it work? It will. Well, my name ain't Will, Wilhelmina. you got to advertise or we'll die. And so the greatest marketing story of all time is here. Advertise or die, dopey. Brought to you by Adwick Magazine, the Radio Advertising Bureau, this radio station on the famous Radio Ranch. Put your message on this national advertising platform. Email classicradiotheater at gmail.com. Classicradiotheater at gmail.com. Now on Classic Radio Theater, more of the lives of Harry Lyme. Pleasure Before Business, March 28, 1952. <laughs> Back in my hotel room, I waited for Joan to return from the Count's Palazzo, tell me how and where those jewels were keeping. I didn't merely twiddle my thumbs, of course. I twiddled my fingers on a phone and made reservations on several different trains and planes because after I got the jewels, a strategic retreat from Venice and from the long arm of Rico would be definitely in order. Finally, quite late... Hello, Harry, darling. Did you find out where the jewels are kept? Oh, let the girl catch her breath, will you? That's small pickings, my dove. What else have you caught? I've had a very interesting evening, Harry. You sound like the local lady's aide. Hope you learned something you can take home with you. The Count is such a sweet old duck. He seems lonely, Harry. Well, that's what you're there for, my Duchess. Now, what did you find out? Oh, he's so grateful for a little attention. He likes to talk to people. Did he whisper that sweet something in your ear about where his jewels are kept? Oh, the the jewels. What keeps them locked in a safe? On that, he's not unique. Now, look, Joan, where is the safe? In the drawing room. It's too bad you never got to see the drawing room, Harry, because it's got one of the loveliest... Safes, I know. Is it on the ground floor? Uh, Yes. Good, I can get in the window. The furnishings in that room, oh, Harry... Don't be greedy, dear. The jewels will have to do. Where exactly is the safe? Oh, it's on the floor. It's built into the floor under the carpet. You should see the designs he's got on that carpet. You should see the designs I've got on that safe. Well, what's the combination? What's the funny thing about that? I, I didn't really notice the combination. What? I mean, consciously notice it, Harry. Consciously, yet... Well, the Count was talking, you see, while he opened it, and he was so interesting His talk that was I... interesting, so you didn't make an effort to notice the combination? That's right. You see, he was telling me about how his family had always had that space in the floor as a hiding place for centuries back, and he himself installed the modern safe there, he and Rico, because this was while Mussolini was ruling the country, and Pucci didn't trust... Pucci... It. Oh, brother. I call the Count Pucci. Oh, isn't that dandy? You know, Harry, he didn't trust the black shirt artisans he would have had to hire because Mussolini... Joan. What? Combination to the safe, honey. Oh, that? Yes, that. Oh. Well, I didn't notice it consciously, but you see, I've trained myself so well that subconsciously, (sighs) well, here's the combination. Good. A little more of that kind of stalling, my sweet, and you'll be having trouble with your Uncle Harry. This does it, Joan. I'll get the jewels tomorrow night. I see. And I keep Pucci away from the palace for you. Not on your life. I want him in that mausoleum when I take the jewels. Oh, but Harry... If he's out, there's always the chance he may come back and catch me if he's in. I wait until he's in bed. Two stories above the drawing room, I'm pretty safe. Two stories with me are as good as an alibi any time. Oh, but Harry, I have a date with Pucci tomorrow night. Joan, all I wanted you to do was to get the combination of the safe. You don't have to do any more work on Pucci Coochie. Counts. Don't I, Harry? Don't I really? No. Remember, on this job, you don't get time and a half for overtime. So I had to postpone the compounding of my little felony. I wanted the Count to be safely in bed when I tackled that safe. Dreamland was one place where he couldn't keep an eye on me. And if Joan had a date with him, it would be inadvisable for her to break it, that's all. Carl mustn't be kept up at night worrying about Joan or anything else. Uneasy lies the head that wears a frown. 
pounds be kept in the mood for deep, happy slumber. So I let Joan keep her date, reflecting that one night more wouldn't matter. But the next night... But I have a date with Poochie again tonight. More smoochy with Poochie. Or was that the last date? Poochie, it seemed, wanted to be a regular fellow with Joan, and she, every curved inch of her a woman, seemed willing to oblige. Finally, I told her that she had to refuse one date. Just one. But Harry, darling, he shows me such a good time. She did, however, refuse him the date, saying that she had to catch up on some correspondence. I think she meant writing letters. The next night, I watched the windows of the palace till all the lights had been turned out, and for some time afterwards, just to be on the safe side, which is precisely where I was heading. It was nearly two in the morning when I jimmied open the window of the Count's drawing room. Joan had told me exactly where to turn up the carpet. I did turn it up, and there was the safe, embedded in the floor. I checked the combination and went ahead, avoiding a temptation to whistle as I worked. Harry! Oh, Joan. Harry, you mustn't take those jewels. Shh, whisper. Jewel. Don't take the jewels. What are you talking about? It isn't fair, What Harry. isn't fair? Taking money from Poochie. Poochie, schmoochie. From March 28, 1952, Orson Welles, The Lives of Harry Lime. I'm Wyatt Cox. Thanks for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite station. Did you ever go outside after a thunderstorm and you smell that fresh air? That's because the rain and the lightning and all that just gets washes all the yuck out of the air. And I don't care where you are. I mean, even up here in the mountains of northern Nevada, we have basically nice air all the time. But it's so much cleaner after a thunderstorm. And I'd like to have you get a thunderstorm for your home. Yeah, the Eden Pure Thunderstorm air purifier it uses proven oxy technology it quickly destroys viruses odors mold the whole nine yards now here's the great thing about it it's teeny tiny just a little larger than a paperback book it doesn't take any shelf space all you do is you plug it straight into the wall or you can take it with you in the car on trips it has a little uh, adapter on it that you can plug it into your cigarette lighter it's real easy to use if you have problems with litter boxes i love my cats but you know it stinks sometimes also cigarette smoke you know smokers this cleans it out of the air this doesn't just cover it up like sprays it actually removes it from the air it cleans it out and like i said no filters and you can get a three pack so you can put one in every room of the house especially you know that room that always stinks you can plug it in there and you get all three units for under two hundred dollars that's a fraction of the cost compared to other purifiers that go over six hundred bucks Put it wherever you need fresh air. I've got one in the office. I've got one in the studio. I've got them everywhere. Go to EdenPureDeals.com. That's EdenPureDeals.com. Put in my promo code CLASSIC3. You'll save over $200. EdenPureDeals.com. Promo code CLASSIC3. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of The Lives of Harry Lime, starring Orson Welles, originally broadcast March 28, 1952, Pleasure Before Business. Are you out of your mind? You'd call it that, Harry Lime. I guess I'd call it love. Call it anything as long as you whisper it. I'm getting out of here before friend Rico gets a crush on me. You're not leaving like this, Harry Lime. You're not going to take those jewels. No, I've heard everything. I think... I don't care what you think. I love Poochie. Do you hear me? Is everybody here, you English woman? Rico, he's got the Count's jewels. Stop where you are, Mr. Lime. I've used this gun before. Okay, okay. Hold your fire, Buster. I think I will shoot. No, this no. was a plan that both of you had, wasn't it? You and a girl. Yes, Rico, it's true. I found out where the jewels were kept. And, oh, I, I love Poochie, and I don't... But... Joan, Joan, you love oh, me. Oh, Poochie, darling. Count de la Robbia, this woman and this man have conspired to rob you. That uh, doesn't matter now. You love me, Joan? I will shoot both of them, Count. Yes, I love Glorioso. you. Glorioso. 
put down that ridiculous gun. Rito. Oh, shit. Yes, you've done your work, kid, Cupid. No need for those thirty-eight caliber darts. Oh, Poochie, we both tried to cheat you and rob you. I'm not what you thought I was. I, I've always lived on my wits. I'm a crook and so is Harry. Oh, pardon me while I put a nickel on the drum. Oh, stop it, Harry. Poochie, we're both guilty. You can kill us, or you can turn us out, or... Or I can take you in my arms. Oh, Poochie. Stay where you are, Mr. Lyman. Sorry, your slightest swish of that gun is my oh, command. Just a moment, Carissima. I must take care of your friend, Mr. Lyman. I'm sorry I cannot oblige you in the matter of the jewels. Oh, of course not. Don't apologize, old boy. Your wife will be needing all this ice to cool her neck on hot summer evenings. Uh, even so. And now I think it would be best for you to leave. I quite understand. No need to show me the door. I will show you to the door just the same. Count, I'm a relatively simple man. My wants are few. Could I, for once, leave your presence without having this gargantuan gargoyle making like a boy scout? Uh, Mr. Lyme, I owe you some gratitude. After all, you did introduce me to Joan. I would like to repay you. I fear I can't. I know, I know. It's not the principle, it's the money. But perhaps I can show you the high regard in which, despite everything, I hold you by asking you to be best man at my wedding. Count Della Robbia and uh, Joan Della Robbia to be and all the little Della Robbias to be. It will be a pleasure. Oh, I'm so glad, Pootie, you don't hold anything against Harry. Oh, quite of the contrary. Goodbye, Mr. Lyon. Arrivederci. And I will go to the door with you. Oh, no, 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 no. Another compound fracture. It'd be too much in one busy week. No, Rico. This man has brought to me great happiness. We must allow him to live like an honest man. Well, at least like an able-bodied man. Who knows? Perhaps such treatment will actually make an honest man of Mr. Lyon. Count de la Robbe, I'm tremendously touched, but I hope I'm never that touched. Goodbye, my dear friend. Goodbye, Joan. Goodbye. Until the wedding, then. Goodbye, Rico. You make a wonderful flower girl. <laughs> and now, Harry Lime. That night, leaving Venice, traveling up toward Milan on the train, I felt almost sorry that I couldn't, after all, be the best man at the wedding of those two people. But it was unfortunately necessary for me to leave Venice immediately, because, you see, on my way out of the Count's Palace that night, uh, unaccompanied, you may remember, by the ruddy Rico, I stopped to admire the little Tintoretto hanging in the entrance hall, the little picture which the Count had said was worth 2,000 pounds. As a matter of fact, that picture was worth 2,250 pounds, and I think I still have the dealer's receipt to prove it. So long now. March 28, 1952, Orson Welles, The Lives of Harry Lyme. I'm Wyatt Cox, and this is Classic Radio Theater. You know, I've told you all how much my feet hurt from time to time, and I've also told you how much I enjoy getting to work, because right here under my desk, I have a pair of my slippers, Mike Lindell's new invention with patented fill, the my pillow fill that, you know, he works in the pillow so well, comfort memory foam, patented impact gel, and it has an indoor-outdoor sole for all-day use. Right now, they are uh, on sale. If you go to MyPillow.com, click on the Radio Listener Square, you will see my pillow slippers at 50% off, but only for a limited time. Plus, you'll get Mike's soft cover book, What Are the Odds, from Crack Addict to CEO. Go to MyPillow.com, click on the Radio Listener Square, use my promo code USA, or call one 800 951 8175. Use my promo code USA. Savings on overstock items too at mypillow.com. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, part three of the five part Years Truly Johnny Dollar Story, The Lamar Matter. This episode originally broadcast March 28th, 1956. From Hollywood, it's time now for. Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this is Vonnie. Oh, yes? Please, come out here to the house, right away. There's something wrong? Johnny, I... You said you came back here to South Bend to... Well, because you didn't want me to have to be alone to face the death of my father. Yes, dear, I... Johnny, you also said you have business here. Well, yes. Is it... Is it connected with my father's death? Vonnie... Please, dear, don't lie to me. He was insured for over a million dollars. Or do you know that? I... Listen... Was this business of yours connected with Daddy? Was it because you, too, think he was murdered? Johnny? I'll... 
I'll come out and see you. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Lamar matter. The question, was it murder? The beautiful girl, Fanny Lamar, and the beautiful romance I found during my so-called vacation at La Jolla, California. Well, things really got into a bind when she received news that her foster father, back in South Bend, Indiana, had suddenly died. And I received word that I was assigned to the case... Not only because of the million and a half policy on Lamar's life, but because it looked as though it might be nothing more nor less than murder. From La Jolla, California to South Bend, Indiana, was only a quick flight by plane. And the first person I contacted was Lawrence Comstock of Trimutual, Chicago office, who'd issued the policies on Lamar's life. Yes, Johnny, the only two real friends Thomas Lamar had these past few years since his wife died were Dr. Ed Wilson and myself. And Wilson is the man you called in when Lamar died. Yes, you see, Tom and I used to spend a lot of time together. Weekend golf, belong to the same clubs, that sort of thing. We used to love playing two-handed pinochle together. Uh Uh-huh. Go on. I was with him at his house the night he died. And so unexpectedly, Johnny, as I told you, he'd had a most thorough physical examination only a few months before. Or I'd never have permitted him to increase his insurance to a million and a half. Must have cost him a fancy premium. It did. It did. Prohibitive. But that was the way he wanted it. For his adopted daughter. For Vani. Whom you know. And if you're half a man, having spent a few days with her in La Jolla, you're in love. Oh, shut up and tell me what you know, will you? You said murder. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, Johnny. It began last weekend. As I often do, I spent the weekend with Tom. Thomas Lamar. Well, Friday night, Dr. Ed Wilson was with us. We played three-handed pinochle. Yes, yes. Tom was in perfect health. I know he was. And our evening was all fun, completely uninterrupted. Except by young Marson. Marson? Tom's confidential secretary. And he's the one. Larry, you are the one who told Pat McCracken back in Hartford that you thought Thomas Lamar was murdered. That's why you wanted me to come on out here to investigate the case. yes. All right, now tell me the truth. Is it because of your great friendship for Lamar? Because of the million and a half policy through your company? Or because you really think he was murdered? Are you here because of the commission you can earn on a case as big as this? Or because Thomas Lamar happened to be the father of Vani Lamar? I was ordered on this case from Hartford. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, of course. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, maybe I'm a silly old fuddy-duddy. Maybe I'm more worked up over this case than you are, whatever the reason. But let me tell you this thing in my own way. Go on, Larry. Well, we know, Ed Wilson and I, I because of being so close to Tom Lamar so long, Ed because of his medical knowledge. We know that Tom was in perfect health. His 59 years were nothing for a specimen like him. Ed left Friday night. I stayed on. Saturday, we played nine holes of golf... Tom wanted to play 18, but I didn't feel up to it. And that night, we played Pinochle. Just the two of us. And we got to bed early. Well, Sunday, we just sat around and talked until evening when we played cards again. There was no strain, Johnny, even if the man had had a bad heart or something. I understand. Now, what about this Marson you named? We quit shortly before midnight. I was tired. My years, no doubt. And I knew Tom would have a hard day at the plant on Monday. And so I suggested we get to bed. He smiled, uh, as only Tom could smile. A warm, tolerant, yet at the same time understanding and friendly, completely friendly smile. Go on, go on. And he said he'd probably have to take one of Ed Wilson's sleeping pills to doze off so early. (laughs) But I knew, Johnny. You knew what? Sugar pills. That's all Ed had ever given him. Sugar pills. I think Tom knew it, too. Well? I went up to my room, Tom to his... I heard the water running in his bathroom. About the same time, I was brushing my teeth. 
And then the crash. Crash? Yes. I ran out through the hall to his room. He was lying on the floor of the bath. Broken tumbler beside him. He left the bottle of sugar pills still open. He'd taken one of them? Yes. And he was dead. You... You mean you no, think... No, no, I called Ed Wilson. He was there in only minutes. It was he who officially said that Tom was dead. Had died instantaneously. And he was sure it was poison. Peculiar color of the lips or something. What do you mean? It was some terrible stimulant to the heart. A very rare drug that only a few researchers would know about. Even the heart of a young and healthy boy would find the influence of this drug too much, too strong. Dr. Wilson told you this? Yes. What is this? Drug? I don't know. Something very rare. But he is sure... That's what did it. Well, what did the police say? You called them in, didn't you? Ed did. They'd never heard of it either, the drug. But they've sent samples of the sugar pills to Chicago and to Washington for analysis. Well? We should hear from them shortly. Where is this Dr. Ed Wilson? Oh, here. I'll, I'll just write you his address. Good, thanks. All right now, Larry. Yes? You told me earlier there was one man you thought might be responsible for this. Who? Walter Marston. Who's Walter Marston? Walter has been Thomas Lamar's personal private secretary for some years. Go on. And Walter has been married to Levon for over a year. Oh, I'm sorry, Johnny, because I, I know how you feel about her. Well. well. Why should that make him want to murder Vonnie's father? Because of Thomas's will. Tom made a will, Johnny, that left virtually everything he owned to the corporation of which he was the head, except for his life insurance. Is that why the amount of his insurance was so big? I suppose so. The sole beneficiary of the policy, as you know, is Vonnie. Oh, go on, go on. Therefore, the only way in which anyone else could share in the estate is by being married to her. All right, all right. You've knocked down a couple of dream castles for me. And I'm not talking about a family fortune. I'm talking about a girl. Yes, John, I understand. If she loved him enough to marry him, let him be happy. If he shares some of that million and a half bucks, so well, let him share it. He deserves to, if she wants him to. He married her, she married him, all right. It isn't as easy as that. What do you mean? You've forgotten you wanted to know why I think Walter Marson murdered Thomas Lamar. Yes. Yes, you see, I happen to know Vonnie did not love Walter. You just said she married him. Unknown to her foster father. What are you getting at? Somewhere, somewhere along the line, Walter Marson, shall we say, got something on Vonnie. What it was, I don't know. But he had a strange power over her, it seemed. Larry, what are you talking about? I don't know, Johnny. From the time Walter first started working for Thomas Lamar, I, well, I didn't trust him. And yet Tom seemed to have the most implicit faith in him. Walter was a good accountant, yes. Handled many of Tom's personal investments. And handled them very well, too. Thomas paid him very well. Rewarded him, always, when he made unusual profits. Why not? But Walter Marson made it plain from the beginning that he wanted to work his way into Thomas's shoes in the corporation. And this Thomas would not have. And the reason? Because Thomas knew that many of the stock deals Walter had made in his behalf were not completely, shall we say, legitimate. Or legally proper, perhaps. But not morally so, that is. Corporation money instead of his own, right? Yeah, that's it. Buying huge blocks in order to inflate the price and then dumping the stocks at their peak, that sort of thing. I don't know much of the details. That's out of my line. But Thomas knew very well that if Walter Marson were ever put into the corporation, he'd use the same slick methods for purely personal gain. At the expense of the corporation, he'd spent his life building up. How do you know about this? I was Thomas's confidant. His closest friend. All right, Larry. Let me do a little summing up. Walter Marson failed to dig into Lamar's money via the corporation. So he married his daughter to be sure of latching on to the family fortune. And that's it. Yes, it's as simple as that. Therefore, you're sure this Marson poisoned Lamar. Yes, and because of the findings of Dr. Ed Wilson. Which haven't yet been verified. Well, No. And even if you do find proof that Lamar was poisoned, you have no proof that Marson was back of it. No. Larry, what if Vonnie had something to do with it? Oh, no. Oh, yes, yes. That's a real possibility, isn't Good it? Good heavens, Johnny, you can't mean that. You, you say you know the girl. Yeah, sure. And I fell for it like a ton of bricks. Whether it's simply because I'm a sucker for such a charmer or just because she charmed me so well, I don't know. But why did she want me if she's already married? Johnny, 
What are you getting at? A million dollars at stake. A million and a half. How she could possibly have known I'd be staying at the La Crescenta in La Jolla, California, I don't know. But with a million and a half at stake, you could find out most anything. So she worked on me, got me on her side, even before she needed to. And when her father died, according to plan, she knew there'd be no question of settlement of a claim for the insurance because of the way she'd so successfully drawn me into a cozy little noose. Johnny, you're out of your mind. Am I? What are you talking about, you old... (sighs) Yeah, I... I guess I am. John, I've been a confirmed bachelor all my life, even before I was your age. But I know very well that if I'd ever met Vonnie Lamar, my bachelor days would have suddenly ended. Oh, you're hurt. Now that you've found out she's married, you're hurt and you're angry. You're striking out at anything you can reach, anyone. And I'm sorry. Don't let it take away your judgment. I'm... I'm sorry, too, Larry. I... I didn't mean it. I really didn't... It's all right, Johnny. But now, get hold of yourself. You have a job to do, not only for me, for the company, but for yourself. Okay, Larry, thanks. Good boy. I... I I don't know what I'm going to do, but... I guess, whatever it is, I... I better start doing it. Yes. Good luck, Jim. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow? Well, it doesn't take long to find out what has to be done on this case, because the turning point in the whole thing comes straight to me. And with a vengeance. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. March 28, 1956, yours truly, Johnny Dollar on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. You can get all of the yours truly, Johnny Dollar episodes uh, through TedRadioMemories.com. They're available in exquisite quality on computer, uh, flat, flash drive for your computer, and also on CD or cassette to play in your regular CD or cassette player, radiomemories.com, and you can also just get his phone number there and his mailing address and correspond with him that way if you prefer. Radiomemories.com, and this radio station also has that information. Uh, please thank this radio station, speaking of which, and support their advertisers. It's their kindness and courtesy that allow us to be with you each and every time we roll around here on your favorite station, won't you please? And uh, while you're doing that, you can, uh, if you miss a day on this station, you do not have to miss a single episode of Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. You can find them on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, TuneIn, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcast, even Amazon's Audible app. But you have to search for Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. That's Classic Radio Theater 
with Wyatt Cox. It's a name that you, if you were looking at us at another address, that's not where we are. We're on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. You can get all that information at our webpage, classicradio.stream, classicradio.stream. Thanks for tuning in. Tell all your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. See you next time we're here on your favorite radio station.